Joining us is Russell Poldrack, a psychologist and scientist at Stanford University who conducted an 18-month study on his own brain that had some interesting results, and he's here to talk about it. By the way, you're listening to American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Brumell with Ethan Euchre and Jeff Wagstaff. So, again, thank you for joining us. How Russell? You do- How you doing, Russell? Good. How are y'all? Very good. Mm-hmm. I think this is, it should be an honor here because Russell's brain has become the most studied brain <laughs> in the world right yes. now uh, through self-experimentation, which I find pretty amazing. Uh, what do you do at Stanford and what was sort of the impetus behind wanting to jump in a, an, M- uh, an MRI machine twice a week for a year and a half? My research is in what we call cognitive neuroscience. We use brain imaging to try to understand how psychological functions work in the brain. And my lab's particularly interested in decision making and self-control and those kinds of questions. One of the things you know, a few years ago that sort of jumped out at me was how we know a lot about how individual brains function and how different people people's brains function differently, but we just didn't know anything about how a single brain changes over the course of weeks and months. And the reason that that's really interesting is that if you look at a number of mental illnesses, for example, depression or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, they change over that kind of time frame of weeks and months. And so if we want to understand those changes, we sort of have to understand first how a healthy individual brain changes over time. And as I started looking, basically realized that there had been no research. And that sort of makes sense. It's a really hard study to do to get a individual to come back, you know, Mm -hmm. repeatedly for months and months. And so I was inspired by some previous research that had been done by Mike Snyder here at Stanford, where he had taken blood from himself over the course of a couple of years and looked at how his biology changed. And I decided, why don't I try to do that using the MRI scanner? Uh, Well, and having a healthy brain, as you said, has got to be quite a bit different than, you know, we've done a lot of stories, a lot of coverage of things like Alzheimer's and things like that, where you can physically see the brain deteriorating over time. So, I mean, what kind of findings did you discover with a healthy brain? Probably didn't change too much, I wouldn't imagine. It fortunately didn't change that much. And if we look at things like brain structure, we actually didn't really see any changes over time in just how big things were. The places where we saw changes were in how different parts of the brain were functionally connected to one another, how their activity changed over time together. The first thing we saw was that if we looked at which parts of the brain sort of changed their connectivity over time, within me, it's very different from looking at which parts of the brain are differently connected across people. And that was one of the first big questions we wanted to ask. If all we had to do was look at the differences between people and saw that the differences between me on different times were the same, then that would suggest we don't need to really study people over time. But the fact that they're so different says that we really do because the patterns are really distinct within versus between people. We also saw that there were certain things that seemed to drive big changes. And one of them, probably the biggest one, was kind of a natural experiment that ended up happening. So on Tuesdays when I went in for my scan, I was fasted and it had no caffeine because mm-hmm. right after the scan, I had to go get my blood drawn for other analyses that we wanted to do. And I needed to not have eaten before that. Whereas Thursdays when I showed up, I had had breakfast and coffee beforehand. So we could compare brain activity on and connectivity on days when I had had breakfast and caffeine versus when I didn't. And what we saw were some really striking differences in sort of how brain networks organized themselves in terms of what particular areas were sort of talking to which other areas areas. And what was really interesting was sort of opposite of what we expected. I would have expected that when I haven't had breakfast and caffeine, everything's just going to be disorganized. I know that I'm more tired on those days. But it turned out that the biggest effect was actually that certain systems, very kind of low level systems like visual systems and motor systems, were actually more connected to one another, more strongly connected on days when I didn't have breakfast and caffeine. Were you looking <laughs> Were you looking strictly at the mapping or were you just looking at the changes in the brain based on these different conditions? We did a bunch of different different analyses. The main ones that we looked at were really how different regions changed in their connections to one another. If we just look at the overall mapping and what does my connectome look like compared to other people's connectome, for the most part, they look very similar. The same parts of the brain that talk to one another in other people pretty much talk to each other within me, though there's some idiosyncrasies. And one of the things that this data set showed us is that individuals really do have idiosyncrasies in exactly how different parts of the brain talk to one another. I would be interested to see, though, if there's a difference between between eating and caffeine. That would be really interesting to know. Mm -hmm. We thought that it was due to caffeine simply because we know that caffeine has effects on blood flow in the brain and obviously has effects on my alertness, but Mm -hmm. that's an experiment that remains to be done. What type of change did you see, though, day to day um, when you did the scans, if you were sick, say, I, I know it says in here that you're a pretty positive, uplifting person, but if you were a little bit down, did the scans 
reflect any of that? We actually didn't see anything really robust in terms of things changing with in connectivity with my mood. We saw okay. things that changed with my alertness and attention and fatigue, but surprisingly not with my mood. And Here was my first thought, Russell, and this just shows you the kind of brain that I have. Maybe you need to scan mine. Um, <laughs> Have you ever seen those things on the internet where they did studies with um, spiders that spin webs under the influence of different drugs, cocaine, LSD, things like that, and they're just completely erratic? Some of I them. I haven't seen that. Why are you looking at me like that, Kimberly? I haven't seen that one either. It's it's a nor, very it's an nor have I. Well, I guess I'm the <laughs> only one. But but no, it's really interesting because they were able to somehow introduce certain chemicals into spiders and then watch how they constructed their webs. And right. depending on what they were given, even something like caffeine, which we all have, affected mm-hmm. right. the symmetry of of their webs. It's really interesting. I uh, encourage you to go look at it. But what I thought was, man. Russell should do this with a human being and put them in there and see how the different substances affect their MRIs. There's been a a lot of work looking at how different drugs affect the brain, and it would be interesting certainly to see how that works within an individual, though that's not an experiment I'm going to go do. (laughs) Reminds me of the old Nancy Reagan, this is your brain, this This is your brain brain on drugs. drugs. It would be an interesting contract. I don't don't know if that would be too ethical, but... um. Ethics, schmethics, who cares? Uh, But so what... What's, what uh, is the biggest takeaway from what you've learned, Russell? And I also know that there's just mountains of data that you have accumulated through 18 months of, of doing this. What do you intend on doing to help uh, sift through that stuff and what conclusions can be made? I would say the biggest takeaway is primarily that there are really interesting and sort of currently unexplainable changes in how one's brain is connected from week to week, month to month. And so really what it says is that we need much bigger studies to go actually see how reliable this is across people and then ultimately how it relates to in people who vary a lot more how it relates to their psychological function so i think it's really more of a proof of concept and say this is something that we really need to go study in more depth and then we're doing a lot of analyses of the data now other people are also taking the data we've made all the data available openly online at myconnectome.org you can download them and fill up your hard drive with several terabytes worth of data if you'd like <laughs> we all have our vices unfortunately Mine is Diet Dr. Pepper. We've discussed this on the air. So when you started talking about caffeine, I feel like I could walk away from anything, but I don't think I could shake the caffeine. And I you can't I don't put even, down your soda. And I don't know that it's because it keeps me alert. What I just feel like I am full on 100% addicted at this point. It's a habit. But what effects, positive or negative, did you see drilling down on just the caffeine issue? It's hard to say. You know, certainly we saw in the measurements of my alertness that I was more alert on those days when I'd had breakfast and caffeine. Because we didn't pull those apart, it's hard to uniquely say that that's related to, to caffeine. And I did, fortunately, by 9 a.m. on those mornings, I was able to go have coffee. So I didn't have to go without it, you know, all day. I think I would be like you, and certainly <laughs> I would have a pretty nasty headache if I tried to do that. Other than saying what we already knew, which is that it kept me alert alert. The main interesting thing is just how it changed, you know, what my brain was doing. It's one of those things that definitely we've introduced to our diet. It's not part of our natural Mm -hmm. diet. So we've introduced it. I was just curious. I I would also like to see, and did you ever have thoughts about trying to introduce or follow somebody that smokes just to see how that addiction is and how it affects the brain? We meant this as a proof of concept to ultimately tell people how to go look at those kinds of disorders. And I think that's where Mm -hmm. this approach is really going to be useful. We started with me because I was a captive audience and I could make sure that I actually showed up at the lab when I was supposed to. Um, But I think you're right that that's exactly the place where this kind of approach is going to be really useful. And once again, Russell, the, what's the website? Myconnectome.com? Myconnectome.org. .org. .org. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if people want to check that out, go go to that. (laughs) Russell Poldrack, a psychologist and scientist at Stanford University that conducted an 18-month study on his own brain. Thank you for sharing the results with us. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. Take care. Have a great one. Fascinating You're, stuff. It is. Mm-hmm. And you learn it here on American Medicine Today. Make sure you stay tuned because coming up after the break, we'll have more.